technology, the space uh, technology, and the Internet of Things. Let us give him a round of applause. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you for introducing me. I'm going to talk about the so-called space IoT. This is a new tendency in uh, the space world uh, and in the hybrid uh, world that has developed in re recent years. And this is essentially because new technologies have appeared and they uh, allow you to deploy space uh, IoT uh, systems, uh, low cost, that give you the possibility of uh, making IoT become a global technology. First of all, why space IoT? That would be the question. If we uh, see the typology of IoT, you know that IoT has a chain of elements or components ranging from a sensor to the cloud and the analytics. It's a long chain of components that communicate data to each other, changing technologies and changing uh, the uh, means of communication. Now, in the lowest part of IoT, we have the sensor and an element of data acquisition that is usually a sensor node, or popularly it is known as mode, and that is a small device op usually operating with batteries and acquires the data of the sensor and then transforms that again from its uh, physical chemical component to a string of data that are transmitted in low power networks, usually wireless, to a node that is the coordinator. The coordinating node actually receives the data of the sensors and transforms them and uh, takes them to the Internet world. And that is where IoT appears. Before that, it's not IoT because the sensors, uh, sensor nodes, as they are small, they can't have a load uh, a stack uh, for those purposes. So this set, node, coordinator, or gateway, is represented in any IoT application in some, uh, in agriculture, uh, precision agriculture, etc. There's always a duality, and the coordinating uh, node is always close because the low power wireless uh, connections are have a small range. Now, if I want to deploy an IoT network globally, I should have many coordinators going round and round around the world. Now, that is why we've seen uh, the appearance of space IoT, a network that could be global where the coordinator is no longer an element that is close to the node, but uh, at an, in a satellite at an orbit that may be 600, 700,000 kilometers distance, and that uh, travels around the world as the LEO, uh, the, the low orbit uh, satellites. They uh, and they are uh, um, in space. So if we develop a constellation of those satellites, I could have a global coverage, and I could have, for instance, sensor nodes here in Paraguay, sensing uh, a wood, or in Costa Rica for a city, or in China, an electric grid, and that network would always be the same global network. That would be the concept of space IoT. And what I'm going to try to explain somehow is what are the technologies, the protocols, especially highlighting the new technologies that make IoT profitable because launching a satellite to transmit just a little data of a sensor may require 1,000, 2,000 bytes per day. Well, that usually is not profitable in large satellites in very expensive satellites. So I'm going to mention a new technology of low-cost satellites that is what is enabling us to develop space IoT.
just uh, becoming familiar with the orbits. Usually, well, we have uh, two types of orbits, the, li the uh, low orbit uh, um, ones going from one pole to the other, the LEO, 200 to 1,000 kilometers, and usually 200. 200 to 1,000. They are also called iliosynchronic because they are synchronized with the sun. They are, are transmitted uh, on Earth at a certain uh, solar hour, and uh, the Earth turns around that orbit, but always at a certain uh, solar time. The other orbits that are also known are the geostationary orbits on the equator, these orbits have a, a peculiarity, and that is that the satellite is always uh, over a certain point of the equator. And that is due to the fact that the satellite also turns around uh, the world, but the speed at which it turns is the same as the Earth's. So they're always on a point of the equator. These were the first orbits to be used in telecom. And uh, they were used uh, for a long time in telecommunications. In recent times, they uh, are no longer so popular because the fiber optic uh, started to flood communi uh, terrestrial communications. And these orbits are not so uh, often used. Uh, but now they are being uh, renovated. So what uh, orbit should we use in space IoT? This is uh, a table where we're comparing the LEO and the GEO orbits. Here there are some parameters that we should take into account at the time of choosing the right orbit for an app in this case. It would be an IoT coordinator. First of all, the cost. The cost of a low satellite, low orbit satellite, is cheaper than a high orbit uh, satellite. Even though, well, it may be high in Leo, but I'm going to show you that they're in more inexpensive. The lifetime of uh, the Leo satellite is low, while the Geo is high. They are designed. And the geo satellites are are uh, planned to uh, last 15 years because they are expensive, so they need to last. This is an important thing: latency. Latency is the time that it takes to the wave to reach from one uh, transmitter or uh, receiver on Earth uh, to the satellite and back. And in the case of LEO, it is uh, lower because it's closer. And uh, the real time, well, in GEO, it's higher. Now, is it possible to do uh, SIOT in real time? That would be the question. In the case of LEO, it is possible if you use constellations. You've seen the constellations that were shown by the speaker that uh, uh, of Huawei. And in the case of uh, GEO, Two, it can be in, done in real time, as long as they are at 120 degrees uh, covering all Earth, and uh, that allows you to take data from the entire planet. This is also called global coverage. In LEO, it is obtained if uh, its uh, LEO's orbit is polar, while in GEO, you need those three satellites at 120 degrees. The cost uh, of the terrestrial platform, the mode the, uh, sensor on land, is low because the distance that it the, the wave has to travel is uh, lower, so it doesn't lead so much transmission power, while in GEO, the cost is higher. The performance of the communication uh, channel is low in LEO, and in GEO, it's from medium to high. The satellite antenna in LEO is omnidirectional, both in the satellite and in the terrestrial node, while in the GEO, they are directional. And the plat uh, antenna in the platform is omnidirectional, and here it is directional. 
the uh, link, uh, the mode, the procedure here, it uses ALOHA and TDMA in GEO, and examples, not new, these are rather old. Uh, they've already been uh, used. They are available for the LEO IoT Argos and in GEO, the GOES, DCS, and in Marsat. These satellites are being used at present. Now, the first applications, uh, a bit of a background, the history, what we can call the IoT, what we now call IoT. At the time, they were, it was not called IoT. It's mainly Argo satellites, very uh, commonly used uh, for remote sensing and uh, for monitoring uh, animals. Uh, it's been used for 20 years. It's a satellite jointly between uh, NOA of the, of the United States and the F uh, French Space Agency. They collect information from a s a small devices, so small that they can be put under the wing of a bird. And with that, they can determine the distances uh, uh, that they travel, they fly in the, as they migrate. That is quite popular in animal science. Another local example is SCD in Brazil. This is a satellite to collect data. This is a satellite. It was entirely developed and launched in Brazil. It is now in operation. And it has the same Argos protocol and carries out the same activities, but mostly over Brazilian territory. A further is the DCS system, a satellite from Argentina, which is called SACD, built by CONAI and the Argentine Research Industry together with NASA and the JP Laboratory. And it is similar to Argus with the same features. This satellite, this DCS system was used during the DCS life period from 2010 to 2015. So that's the life of, the, of that satellite, but then it was replaced by other satellites developed by Gornai and also a radar system. But now a new satellite is in progress, which will be launched soon. These are some of the commercial applications we have at present. These are the result of a uh, web search. Some of these are local applications in Nova Space from Argentina, or also the TESACOM group. But you have others that are global ones like Mariota and Starlink. Starlink is the internet service satellite providers. And I can also use IoT transmit IoT data through some of these networks. They also support IoT. Satellite IoT is a new satellite that was launched recently from Spain. It connects in 5G. You, 5G, as you know, is a new, depending on the project country, is the new mobile phone technology and specifically has uh, uh, narrowband uh, channels for IoT. A bit of technology, architecture, technology, and protocols of on space IoT. This would be the normal architecture of a space IoT system. You see various satellites in the uh, space, and this is similar to the presentation we had on one web on the first day. These satellites travel in constellations in order to cover the globe. Very often, these satellites communicate with one another, what we call ISL, the intersatellite links. And then they have Earth endpoints where the data is downloaded. On the 
Earth, you have the sensors, uh, the marine and terrestrial ones, and also in the cities, and those that upload the data to the satellites. The satellite communicate the data to one another and then download it to terrestrial endpoints where these are then distributed. So basically, this would be space IoT. The coordinating node of these terrestrial systems is no longer next to the terrestrial nodes, but is rather in space. This is basically what the satellites do in the case of space IoT. An internal structure of a normal satellite looks like this. This is the internal structure, which was we call the flight segment. This is the same for all the satellites. This is the services part where you can see the sensors and the actuators. This system over here has magnet Torx system and allows you to position it in a given place in order to meet the requirements of a special application. This is particularly the case for the satellites that do images. Then you also have the power control unit that has the bundle, uh, uh, the batteries and the solar cells. And then you have the communications part that is the one that the satellite uses to communicate with the terrestrial station. There you have the telemetry command. The terrestrial unit receives the data from the satellite in order to provide the command. In this case, if this were an IoT system, there is a second communication system, which is the one in charge of communicating with the terrestrial nodes. Of course, there is also a central system, which is called the OBC, the onboard computer, which commands all the other modules. All this is contained in an electronic system. If this were built by a space agency, or if this were built by a company that requires good uh, functionalities, it should be built according to spatial technology or the military features. But the new trend that I'm commenting on, the electronics, is based on a technology called COTS, commercial off the shelf. In other words, I do it with what I have in the drawer of my desk. So this is normal technology, maybe not commercial technology, but it is industrial technology with ranges of minus 22 plus 80 degrees, but it doesn't have commercial features. Therefore, these are much speed cheaper compared to the normal satellites manufactured in the space agencies. The technology that is normally used is the CubeSat technology, satellite in a cube. This cube is 10 times 10 centimeters. This technology was already invented a few years ago and has become standardized. There are several companies that manufacture these structures, and these then get the different uh, panels, the ADCS for altitude determination, OBC, the COM systems, the EPS, and of course the payload, which is what the instrument contained in this satellite. All this fits into 10 times 10 times 10 centimeters and weighs a kilo and a half to two kilos. These cubes can be stacked. This is what we call a unit, and these can be stacked with other units, uh, two, three, or four units, depending on the application and depending on what you wish to do with that satellite. These satellites are normally launched in a format which we call piggyback. So 
in addition to the larger satellites that are launched. Although recently, there are rockets that are particularly used for launching these CubeSats because these CubeSats are sort of invading the entire space. These are systems that are designed at universities. This is how these were created, namely to create space technologies to graduate and postgraduate students. But this now has become popularized in other startup, startups that are launching these satellites, even some that are smaller than 10 times 10 times 10 cubic centimeters. So some are half the size. And normally, they do IOTE, spatial IOTE. This is a low-cost technology, low-cost satellites, and of course, in a space environment of 200 to 2,000 kilometers in height. This is quite a harsh environment, quite a dangerous environment. You'll recall that in that range you have the magnetosphere. The magnetosphere captures the solar activity, and there is an abundance of particles and waves from a couple of mega electron volts. So that is very dangerous in terms of electronics. Sometimes you can produce reactions that can change the memory from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. So this is a bit dangerous environment like an atomic environment, like a low intensity atom bomb. So space technology try to mitigate this by having components that are prepared for radiations. These are expensive components, but these are not hard rad components. And at those heights, there is no oxygen, there is no atmosphere. So temperatures are either very high or very low. One of the sides of the satellites that is facing the sun might be at 400 degrees Celsius, whereas the opposite face, the one that looks into the deep space, might be at minus 40 degrees Celsius. So there are more than 400 degrees Celsius difference in just 10 centimeters. As a result, this leads to making insulation of utmost importance. These satellites, of course, are not protected against radiation, and they don't have any redundancy. They're not protected against temperature. So the life cycle of these satellites is very low. I would say this is about six months to one year, whereas a satellite manufactured by a state agency for the same purposes might have a life cycle of five years. But of course, the costs are significantly lower. So some companies prefer to launch many of these low-cost satellites instead of building a high-cost satellite. So that would be the economic equation. This is a sensor node. The sensor node is the one that is on the Earth. This is a small node that is normally battery fed. Of course, it has different acquisition and communications unit that conveys the forwards the information to the satellite. The features are that they are autonomous, they are cheap, they can be transportable, they are robust, and they're reliable too. And because they are cheap, they can be replicated as like specs of technology, motis, that can be distributed on the ground at a low cost. There are two types of satellite constellations in general terms. The same happens in the case of IoT. This is a centralized type of satellite constellation. Here you have two satellites. There can be more satellites if you wish. They receive information from the 
from the earth, and these are then transmitted to the central station. Now, one of the features of this architecture, of this constellation, is that it cannot be in real time because these satellites are traveling in space and they might obtain information in a given point on the Earth that is not visible by the Earth station. This, therefore, has to store the information supplied by those places on the Earth. And then this is what we call the store and forward. And depending on the satellites that are orbiting the Earth and depending on the time from the moment uh, data is generated will then lead to this. But in fact, this is not real time. This system is used when the application I have on Earth is an application that is delay tolerant. If I measure temperatures and I need to generate, uh, I don't need to generate alarms, but just collect this information for processing purposes, the data can, uh, are not necessary to be kept, to be made available right away for processing because uh, the uh, visa purpose of the project. So this is what we call delay tolerant networks. This infrastructure is addressed at that type of applications. In addition to that, we have what we call the dynamic constellations. The satellites connect with one another through optical networks. This is what the satellites do that have internet. So because the satellite the communication between satellites takes place in real time. What we are generating over here can be achieved by the, almost in real time. So these are applications that are necessary when we have delay sensitive applications. So that is when we use these types of sat uh, constellations. These are the constellations that you saw in uh, YYA. Uh, for the, uh, um, it, it does not tolerate uh, delays. So there are mapping and routing um, examples here. The, these are not the most usual in IoT, but uh, they can be seen. So finally, what is uh, the technology for uh, linking the sensor node and the satellite? Remember that uh, the wave must uh, go through at least uh, 600, 1,000 kilometers in distance. Uh, so you, it needs to have enough sensitivity to reach uh, the satellite. So there are several technologies. One of them quite well known is the LoRa technology that belongs to a type of uh, communications that is called a low power wide area network is highly representative of that sort of technologies, but there are others too. LoRa has two aspects. One of them is LoRa One that covers the physical layer and the communications. And LoRa One is the layer, the MAC layer, uh, and uh, here you have the modulation, the frequency bands, and how LoRa1 works. How does it work? Well, it's actually that. It's a physical layer and uh, uh, link layers that transmit uh, to a, s a satellite that circulates over it. So this technology has been approved for those distances, and there are several satellites that are already working with a lower one, with a little uh, power in the antenna. This is uh, one of their uh, ads. They their publicity says that they can do the NTN low the low terrestrial networks. So they say that they are capable of doing it with LoRa. Another technology that's being used is the narrow one, 
uh, IoT. This is a technology that was added to the uh, uh, cell phone uh, technologies to precisely to transmit IoT, that is low bandwidth uh, uh, signals with uh, uh, little data. It's part uh, of uh, the 3GPP, and uh, it is. Uh, they also have concordance in 5 and 6G. So this is also being used in satellites for IoT. In this case, as the, we need uh, a licensed frequency, so this is being used by the companies that uh, uh, have a license, that is, uh, the uh, mobile phone companies. So that was uh, a quick overview of uh, space OIT, OIT. In, in the end, new, te it's new technology with uh, a risky technology, uh, cut, but that can meet the needs uh, of uh, the cost of uh, people because it's low cost. It's uh, an IoT satellite must necessarily be low cost if you want to meet the needs of low cost for the global clients. For instance, one of these companies, I won't mention the name, charges for each node four dollars a year to transmit up to 1,000 bytes per day. Those costs, I think that they can only be attacked if you use these cheaper satellites. Being so cheap, they can uh, uh, you can flood uh, the space markets with these technologies. There are several technologies already. Another conclusion that you can draw is that there are not so many standard protocols. If I try to use uh, some, of, uh, some of those companies that I mentioned initially, the companies uh, being used, probably if I have a sensor of another company, I won't be able to transmit with the satellites of this company, but so interoperability will be a problem in the future. This is a topic that needs to be discussed if you want to develop the protocols necessary for standardization. Thank you. Muchas gracias, este, Gustavo, por tu presentación y charla sobre. Thank you, Gustavo, for uh, your talk on space. IOT. With this, we complete this uh, uh, these lectures, and we invite uh, the, our LACNAG hosts, uh, Carlos and Jorge, who will give us the final.